Well, folks, it's uh, great to see you out of church. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we give you a very warm welcome. And uh, it's good to see you. Very few announcements. Uh, sorry there's no announcements she today. One, one of the reasons for that is there's very few announcements. Uh, just to say that there is a service tonight. And it's at 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll be looking again at the life of David. We, we looked at last week how David fought the dwarf. He was a dwarf as far as God was concerned. Uh, he might have been a giant as far as the people of Israel were concerned. But when David saw Goliath, he saw him as God saw him. And, and that was just as a dwarf. Someone who thought he was great, thought he was wonderful, and ended up not being wonderful at all. And so we're looking at the aftermath of that tonight. So if you're free at 7 o'clock tonight, it'd be great to see you uh, out at church uh, for that service. And one other night, prayer meeting continues at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. We're going to try and continue that over the summer. Uh, I think it's good for us to meet together, even two or three of us, uh, that we may continue to pray for the work of God here in Sydney and, and across the world. One other announcement, and that is the Holiday Bible Club. Uh, it begins on the 18th of September. It's from half past six at night. Did I say September? August, August, the 18th of August. Thank you. And uh, 18th of August. It's just a half six at night to eight o'clock. And we desperately need helpers for that. Our good friends from Knock are going to help, but the vast majority of workers uh, should come from here. And the reason for that is that I'm hoping that after the Holland Bible Club, a lot of the young children who come will continue to come, and therefore the faces that they get to know will be the faces from Strand itself. Don't be afraid to volunteer. Sometimes people are afraid thinking, oh, I couldn't do it, I, I couldn't lead the singing, or, or I couldn't tell a story, or, or, or I couldn't do the memory verse. We actually need lots of helpers to do lots of things that are not up front. And we have quite a number of helpers already. But if you're able to help, would you write your name on the list? There's a, there's a list at the back. I think we need about 24 helpers altogether. And uh, so I think we need another 10 or 12. And so if you're able to help with that, and if you're a teenager, then we really want you to help with it uh, and to put your name forward for that. Uh, it would be a great help for us. And if you volunteer, you get a free gift. And the free gift is a t-shirt. Oh, we are so ge I just can't believe how generous we can be. So therefore, when you sign up to come, no matter who you are, you'll get a t-shirt. And uh, write your name. And then all you have to do is, this is anonymous, then what I want you to do is, on the other side of the page, there's small, medium, large, and extra large. Uh, you need a tent. Well, we'll do tent size. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'll do that especially for you. Are you volunteering? Right, you put your name down and I will get you a tent. You need to come just to see this tent. It will be something else, eh, Bernard? And all you do is take the wee box and if you want a Bernard size, just put a B and tick that there and there might be more than Bernard coming to volunteer. If you're able to do that, I can guarantee you the medium will fit you perfectly, Bernard. And, and uh, so you just tick the box and it's totally, totally anonymous. And it means then we can order the right t-shirts. Uh, and therefore, if you don't put your name and you don't tick the box and then you come and help, you're going to get a size medium. And, and, and that could be a struggle for some of us. That's why I made sure I ticked extra large. So if you're able to do that, we'd really appreciate it. Just about the names now at the end of June, it means then we get together at the beginning of uh, August to start talking about what we need you to do. I promise you that we'll do nothing up front. For anybody who volunteers, if you don't want to do anything up front, there will be nothing up front. But we do need a number of helpers uh, to move around, and we'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, one of the lovely things about coming together uh, to, to worship God is that there is a free gift. Um, and uh, I think that uh, one of the, the, the most helpful things that I've heard um, someone say about prayer and worship is that the first priority of these things is always that we allow ourselves to be loved by God. We, we come to church often with various different agendas and various feelings and various things we want to see happen. But the first priority when we gather together and when we meet God on our own is that we allow ourselves to be loved by God. 
So our worship of God is a response to the fact that this morning we are here as people here accepted and we're people here who are loved. So before we stand this thing, let's just be still and to know that God is here and that we are loved. Father, thank you that your love and your grace are free gifts for us. Help us to worship you as people who are loved. Amen. Let's stand and sing uh, Holy Holy. Um, you'll, you'll know that a few of the times I, uh, I've led, I've always started with a Holy Holy song. This is the other Holy 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 song. Um, and it's just a, a way to remind ourselves that we start by acknowledging who God is uh, uh, and that he is holy. So let's stand and hopefully it's the, uh, no, it's the, other, it's the old one. Okay, we'll do the old version then. Martin, it's on. If it's there, it's there. It, it is. It's the attempt this morning. Well, let's stand anyway. Just while they find the song, and I'll do a very long introduction. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you that in the stillness we can know that you love us. And as we've come from many different backgrounds, as we've come from many different types of weeks, the week that we've had, we come together and acknowledge that you are here. And you're here to love us, to care for us, to remind us who we are in you. And because of that, we can sing praise. We can tell you that you are holy. We are only repeating what you have first told us. 
We tell, tell you that you are the Lord God Almighty. And the only reason we can tell you that is because you've revealed yourself to us. We can call you Father only because you give us permission to do so. And so we thank you that you've been with us this past week. You've led, you've guided, you've blessed, you've strengthened us. For some, it's been a week of relaxation, and we thank you for that. For others, Lord, it's been a week of, of good news and lots of exciting things happening, and we bless you and thank you for that. For others, it's been a difficult week. It's been a sad week. It's been a tiring week. And for that, Lord, we thank you that you have helped us, that you have strengthened us. You have given us grace upon grace, you promise us that we will not avoid the difficulties in this life. For we live in a world that is full of sin. We live in a world full of sinners and we are the chief of those sinners. But you do promise that as we walk through the fire, you will be with us. As we go through the difficult days, you are there to lead us and to guide us and to strengthen us and sometimes even to carry us. And so it's only fitting and proper that we come this morning and our hearts are full of joy, not because of our circumstances, it might even be despite of our circumstances, we come because you are here. And you will accept our praise and our worship. You are here to remind us that you love us. And so all that we do this morning, we pray that your name will be honoured. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If the young folk would like to leave now for Sunday Pals and TFY, it's been good to see you. Oh, 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 oh. 
technology is great, isn't it? it? really is. I like to read from God's Word. I'm going to read from 1 Peter and uh, chapter 3. Peter has been talking to the church uh, to encourage them uh, to live as Christ lived and to follow his example. And he goes on to say, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that is within you. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Amen. We, we continue our study of uh, the, the Apostles' Creed. And we've been going through the Apostles' Creed uh, and learning much from it and recognizing that it's the creed of our faith. And, and we've been looking at various, um, very, various aspects of the Apostles' Creed. And uh, it, everything's working wrong today, isn't it? There we go. And, and we're looking at the point. Today we're looking at he descended into hell. We looked last week how he suffered and how he died on the cross. And this morning we're looking at he descended into hell. Uh, I said to Martin, Martin preached really well last week, and I said, leave that wee bit about descending into hell until next week, because I want to have a look at that one, because it's a wee bit awkward uh, at, at what, what the Apostles' Creed means by that. And so this week, as I've been reading it and studying it and thinking about it and praying about it, I've come to the conclusion, and I need to recognize that the Apostles' Creed has been there for many, many centuries. Uh, our, our, our first uh, note that we have of it in writing is in the 6th century uh, AD. And so it's been going on for centuries and centuries. It's called Apostles' Creed because we believe it's, it's what the apostles taught. But when it comes to this part, he descended into hell. Uh, I struggled when I thought about what I should say. And uh, some theologians see it as what that means is that Christ went to hell as the victorious Son of God, victorious over sin, victorious over Satan, and victorious over death. And so he went down to hell to, to release those who were in bondage in hell. And, and that's really how most scholars look at this. And as I was looking at it and thinking about it, I thought, I'm not really quite sure if that's what it means, or I'm not really quite sure if that's what Christ said. In other words, from, from dying on the cross on the Friday to rising again on the Sunday, he descended into hell. That's, that's the normal understanding of, of that term. And the more I thought about it, and the more I studied it, and uh, although most scholars would argue that that's what happened, I'm really not quite sure. So I'm going to preach this morning, and understanding the one I'm about to preach, uh, lots of scholars wouldn't agree with me. So, so what I want you to do is to take away what I've said and think about it for yourself. And uh, the normal understanding is that from the Friday uh, on the cross, when he died on the cross, to the Sunday morning when he rose again, he descended into hell. And there he, what he did down there, according to First Peter, is that he released the, the spirits in bondage. The spirits have been born since the time of Noah. And so that's the normal understanding of that. What I want to do is preach this morning and, 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 and uh, explain why I don't think that is the case. And then I want to go on to think about what, what's hell like? Because here's an opportunity for us to talk about hell. We don't talk to hell about hell much. And so I thought this morning I'd have to think about what hell is and, and, and what, what, what it means to be going there. 
And, uh, but I want to first of all look at this, this idea that Christ had descended uh, into hell. There's two passages uh, in the New Testament that might suggest that he descended into hell uh, from the Friday until the Sunday. Uh, this is the main passage in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. There's another passage in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 9 when it says that, that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth. I think as far as that verse, if you, if you read it in context, I think really what, what, what Paul is telling the church at Ephesus is that the Son of God, the glorious Son of God, came down to every single part of the earth. There wasn't anywhere on the earth that Christ did not come to, in the sense that when he came down to earth and he died on the cross, it was effectual, uh, not just for those living in Jerusalem, not just for those living in Israel, but for the whole of the earth. And I think that's really what Paul is meaning in Ephesians. This chapter here is a wee bit more difficult to try and understand what he means. Uh, because reading it naturally, it seems to sound as if that after he died on the cross, he descended into hell, and there he, he let those who were in captive in hell uh, at the time of Noah, uh, and, and he released those spirits, uh, and, and, uh, and that's what he did in, in hell. There's a couple of, of theological problems that I have with that, uh, if, for that understanding of it, uh, and I think there is another understanding that, that actually makes it, cl well, I think, makes it clearer uh, and, and therefore contains all what the Scripture teaches about who Christ is and, and what hell is about. So I believe really that this passage is, is not saying, I believe it's not saying that Christ, after he died on the cross, descended into hell and there he, he let those captives free. Uh, I don't think that's what it's saying for, for two reasons. The first reason is this. I, I have a problem thinking why Christ would descend into hell to, to release those people in hell who lived at the time of Noah. I have a problem with that. And the problem I have with that is if you read the story in Genesis chapter 6, then what you read is that God looks to the world. And when he looks to the world, he's disappointed. It's amazing in six chapters, when we read in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, into chapter 2, that God made the world. And after he made the world, he said, you know, it's good. It's very good. And the whole attitude you get from that passage is that God is pleased with what he made. I don't know about you, but I used to do woodwork at school. It was compulsory for your first two years, I think it was. It might have been three years. And everything that I made, I was able to put it aside and think, that is absolute rubbish, without a doubt. No matter what I made, it was rubbish. It was so bad that I threw it out before I got home. Because I know my dad would have looked at it and he said, son, that's only fit for the fire. And so um, before he said it, I made sure it was in a bin from, from our school to that there. I remember I made a, made a, a boat, and uh, I should have named it Titanic because in this maiden volley, a volley from the school gates to our house, it sank in, in a neighbor's bin. Uh, I made a stool uh, that, that really would have been perfect on a mountain uh, because it didn't have four straight legs. I made a pile of stuff. And everything I made when I looked at it, I thought, I can honestly say it was rubbish. It was the only time, this, this sounds boring, so I don't mean it in that way, but there's only time in school that I got a D. I always got a D for woodwork. Uh, and, and it was because no matter what I made was rubbish, absolute rubbish. But when God looked at the world at the end of chapter 1, beginning of chapter 2, and he looked at the mountains, and he looked at the rivers, and he looked at the animals, and he looked at Adam and Eve, he said, that's good. He was delighted with it. In six short chapters afterwards, he looks at the world and he says, have I made a mistake? Is this what it's about? And he says, he regretted, the Bible tells us, he regretted making the world because of what man had done to the world. I can't imagine then why Christ would have went to the Spirit's who would have died at the time of Noah. Remember, only eight were saved. Everyone else in the world was, was killed. Why God would go down to hell 
and released those people, those people that when he looked on me, he thought, they're such a disappointment. So, so I have a problem theologically for Christ to have done that, if, if that's what this verse is saying. And I also have a, a, a problem too with why God would have done that, not only for these people, but why only these people? Because what about all the people who lived before Noah? And what about the millions of people who lived after Noah? Because they also heard about God's offer, to, I'm talking about the Israelites, they heard the offer of salvation to them. And very often they rejected it. They rejected it so much that God allowed the northern kingdom in 721 BC to be destroyed. He, 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 he was so disappointed with the people in 589 BC that he allowed Jerusalem and the temple to be destroyed because the people kept disobeying God. And so for centuries after Noah, the people of God kept doing what the people of Noah did. God gave them an opportunity to repent. God asked them time and time to repent. And they always said no. So why would God go down to this particular group of people at this particular time to release their spirits from hell? And he would leave the others. So that's the two problems I would have if that's how you interpret this passage. And many folk interpret this passage as meaning like that. And so I'm going to, against the sway of, of lots of thought, I want to tell you that at the beginning. Uh, I, I cannot see that for those two reasons. I think a way of interpreting this passage uh, that fits in with the passage and, and doesn't take away from the passage, because it's important that whatever passage you look at, that you don't take away from the context of the passage. It's always important to read the context of the passage before you interpret the passage, because if you don't, then you can interpret to mean anything out of its context. And so you look at the context. The context is that what, what Peter is saying to the church, he's saying, I want you to live like Christ. I want you to live despite what others think. He recognizes the church is going through persecution. The church is going through a tough time. And the reason they're going through a tough time in persecution is because they're standing up for Christ. And people are against that. He also is aware, though, that there's others within the church that are going through persecution because they're a pain in the neck and, and, and they're awkward to get on with. And, uh, and so he's here talking to, to try and encourage them, stay firm in your faith. Continue to be like Jesus, despite what others might think, despite what might happen to you. You stay close to Christ. Because Christ came and he died for you. And then he gives this example of, of uh, it says that Christ descended uh, and, and talked to the spirits uh, uh, in prison as in the days of Noah. Uh, I, I think what he's saying there uh, is this. Throughout the Old Testament, remember what we said, that Jesus, as we've been singing, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. So Jesus always was, he was, he is, he is to come the same. He never changes. And therefore, when we read the Old Testament, there's a number of things that we say about the Old Testament. Whenever we read about a prophet or we might read about a king, we say that they're a type of Christ. In other words, they show something of Christ in their life. Uh, as, as they witness for God, as they speak for God. And, uh, and so therefore we, we see it almost like they're prototype Christ. In other words, they're, they're pointed to the fact of who Christ is and what they say and how they live their life. And I think this passage is saying that in the days of Noah, through Noah, Noah is filled with the Spirit. And therefore as Noah is declaring the truth about God, it is Christ declaring the truth. And whenever, whenever the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the Old Testament and speaks, it's as if Christ is speaking through them. And he speaks the truth. And the people ignore the truth. And as the people ignore the truth, then they're not saved. Noah, even though Noah is rejected, even though Noah is, is, is mocked uh, by the people, Noah continues to be faithful. And as he continues to be faithful, he and his family are saved. And I think that's the context of this illustration. What he's saying is, as Christ spoke through Noah and the people rejected him, the spirits who are in prison, because they're still in prison, because that's an aspect of hell that we will look at uh, in a moment or two. Uh, and so what he's saying is here is that the witness of Noah is redeemed. 
is justified uh, and shown to be the truth. And that's why I think this passage is saying, and therefore I don't think that Jesus descended into hell from the Friday to the Sunday to release the spirits of those who have been in prison since the days of Noah. I, I, I can't see it as far as theology is concerned, and I can't see it why, why, how it fits in with the rest of Scripture, to be honest. I think he's using this as an example to say that as in the days of Noah, as, as the Spirit spoke through Noah, Noah remained faithful. So you Christians living there, and we think he's speaking to the Christians in Rome, you Christians who are suffering because of everybody's turned against you, then remain faithful. And if you remain faithful, then God will be faithful to you. I think that's what this passage is saying. So for a moment or two, I want us to think about hell. It's a subject that we don't like to talk about. It's a subject that lots of Christians don't like to talk about. And, and, and some Christians have even denied hell uh, because they say God is a God of love. If God loves us so much, why would he send anybody to hell? Why would he allow a place like hell to exist? if God loves us. And so lots of Christians actually believe that when you die, when you're judged before God, then you cease to exist. That's what they prefer to believe because that would be fairer of God or that would be more loving of God. And uh, for instance, none of us remember what it was like before we were born. And Christians then, some Christians teach that after you're judged by God, that's the way it becomes. That cheapens the, the, the character of God. And it cheapens the cross of Christ. And what it does, it does a great disservice to people who are lost. Because it's really important that we all understand as Christians what hell is like. And it's important too that our non-Christian friends, family and neighbours understand what hell is like. If hell is real, and the Bible teaches that hell is real, uh, and, and it's going to be a reality for people, it's really important that we Christians know what it's like. Not because we're going there, but because what it does, it motivates us more than anything to pray for our friends and our neighbours in this world and to live for Christ in such a way that as many people as possible hear about the gospel of Christ. Because more than anything, I, I, I was talking to a couple of folk, or a couple of folk were talking to Scott the other day there, and, and they said that they probably wouldn't want to come to Strand. Because if they came to Strand, they, they would maybe have to get involved in the work of Strand. They prefer to go to a church where uh, they don't have to actually work. They, 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 they've come to us a few times and they've enjoyed coming, but they said they'd rather not come because there's too much work to be done in Strand. I am sorry for that. I'm sorry for them and I'm sorry for us because they're lovely folk. But the bottom line is this. If we have a reality of what hell is like, then nothing would stop us working in every area of our life to reach those who are lost. The first thing about hell, very, very quickly, because as you can see, we have communion this morning, but I do want to share two or three things about hell. The first thing about hell is that it is real. Although we would love it not to exist, it exists and it's there. And it's going to be a reality for those, every single person who is not a Christian. C.S. Lewis said one time when he saw a grave of an of a atheist who said, you know, I was, and now I'm no more. And C.S. Lewis said, if only that was true for him, but it's not. Because every single person who dies without Christ will be going to hell. And that is guaranteed. As much as it is that our salvation is guaranteed, those who are not Christian, it is guaranteed 100% that they go to hell. And, and, and that is, is, a, is a reality that, I don't know about you, but that drives me to my knees. That drives me to, to think that I will do anything for the folk in Sydney and anybody to think that I can try and get them in, in some ways to, to realise what hell is like and to realise how glorious salvation is. So first of all, there's lots of things we can say by the fact that salvation, or, or that is, uh, hell is real. But the second thing I want to say is hell is really bad. There's lots of biblical terms, uh, hell, and there's lots of descriptions for hell that Jesus speaks about and Revelation speaks about. And so Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, when he talks about hell, he talks about hell as a real place. And he talks about hell, first of all, as a place of physical suffering. 
when we're in hell, if we go to hell, we will suffer eternally. Physically, we will suffer. It will be a terrible place of suffering. A number of months ago, about a year or so ago, uh, I had a problem, as you remember, and my gallbladder had merged into my liver, and I went to the doctor, I went to the hospital one night, and the pain was awful. I don't know what it's like ch- having given a birth to a child, but this was far worse. <laughs> far, far worse. I'm sure it was, without a shadow of a doubt. And uh, anyway, I went, I went to the hospital, and the pain was awful, and, and, and I went in to talk to the nurse, the triage, and she said, I'll get you some um, paracetamol. I said, listen, forget about paracetamol. If you give me a shot of morphine, that would do me well. She said, no, no, sorry, I have to start with the paracetamol. I said, look, the paracetamol won't do for me. She says, no, that's how we have to start. And she gave me these two wee tablets. I thought, what a waste of time. I took the tablets, made no difference. Not only that, they made me sick. So I went outside and was sick. And for four hours, I'm walking about the place, moaning my head off to anybody who came out of triage, uh, not the patients, but any of the nurses, about this pain. Eventually, I get, I, I was violently sick lots and lots of times. Eventually then, I go in, and thankfully Lorraine's with me, Lorraine's the Christian of the family. And we went in to see the doctor. By this stage, I couldn't stand, I couldn't sit. I was, I was on the floor, curled up, and the doctor said, tell me, now, you know, Miss, I'm, I'm a very kind and loving and quiet person. He said to me, tell me your story. And in broad Glasgow, I said, story, story, just give me morphine, forget about the story. I said, the pain was awful. I thought, tell you a story. I'm telling you no story. I said, just get the morphine in me. And Lorraine, oh, no, no, no. And Lorraine told the story. I says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go and get the morphine. Ten minutes went past. I said, Lorraine, get out there quick and get that morphine. Now, they gave me the morphine. It made no difference. The pain was awful. And the only thing the morphine did was made me more sick. And there was this drunk man, what a cheek, there was a drunk man beside me in, in this cubicle. And when I started being sick, he went and complained about me. He went and complained about me. He said, I'm not staying in there with him. He's being sick. And the drunk man wouldn't stay with me. I think he thought I was abusive. I'm not quite sure. Or maybe the way I was moaning in Glaswegian. I'm not sure. The pain was awful. Hell is far, far, far worse than that. And there's no morphine in, in hell. Physical pain, terrible. Relational pain as well. Relational, people tend to think, I've heard people say to me, if my loved one is going to hell, I want to go to hell too. I don't want to go to heaven and be separated from my loved one. Unfortunately, in hell, there is no relationships. As far as people are concerned, the Bible tells us in hell, it's as if you're the only one there. You will have no relationship with anyone in hell. Hell, you will have, not how sometimes whenever you're going through a tough time, it's nice to talk to somebody, it's nice to share with somebody and, uh, and, 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 and help one another. In hell, there is nobody to talk to. It's almost like uh, solitary confinement. There will be no one that you will talk to for eternity in hell. In hell, not only is the pain real physically, the pain is real as far as relationships are concerned. There is no one to talk to. Hell is a completely uh, self-contained unit just for those who are there. There is it's almost as if it's a vast, vast crowd, uh, row of, of, of self-contained cells where it's just you suffering pain. It sounds awful, doesn't it? It's emotional suffering. Because why it's emotional suffering? It's the sense of, of the sense of loss. The Bible tells us, and I don't understand how this works, but the Bible tells us in heaven there is no more pain, no more suffering, uh, uh, no more tears. And yet obviously in heaven not everyone will be there. And I can't imagine why I will not be sad in heaven. I have to be honest. Uh, but the Bible tells me I won't be. But, but I know there's people who have died, people who have really loved and respected. And as far as I know, they haven't given their lives to Christ. So I don't know how I will be happy in heaven. But the Bible tells me I will be. But in hell, there will be so many uh, painful memories that folk will have, lost opportunities. You see, everyone who is condemned to hell will we'll, we'll speak to God face to face. They will, they will face God. And they will realize 
God is real. They will realize that God is loving, God is kind, God is gracious, but God is holy. And for eternity they will live to regret never trusting Christ in this earth. That's what hell is like emotionally and also spiritually. They realize that hell is separation from God and therefore there is no hope. We sing there is a hope. The hope that we have is the hope in Christ. I know I'm going to heaven. I have hope that I'm going to heaven. Not the hope that I hope to win the lottery. I'll never win the lottery because it'll do the lottery. But it's a, it's a, or I hope it's nice weather tomorrow. I had a wedding yesterday and on and, and Wednesday we had to practice. And the young folks said, Danny, I hope it's dry on Saturday. And I said, well, the weather forecast says it's dry. Well, we don't rely on the weather forecast, they said. And, and they were right, but it was good all the same. We can hope that the weather is good. We can hope Belgium wins the World Cup. Uh, we hope that England will qualify next time. Or, or whatever hope you might have. And some of those hopes are daft hopes because they'll never happen. But the hope we have in Christ is hope based on God and his character. And therefore, hell is recognizing that there is no hope. That's what hell is like. The second thing about hell, or sorry, the third thing about hell, the first thing is that it's definitely real. The second thing is bad. The third thing is it's eternal. It will go on forever. There's never a day when it will finish. And the fourth thing about hell, wonderful this is about hell, while we're here in this life, it's avoidable. It's avoidable. And all we have to do, it's not difficult, all we have to do is ask the Lord to be our Lord and our Savior, to forgive our sins, to ask Him to come into our lives, to be our Lord and our Savior and our Master. And you know, from that moment, our sins are forgiven. At that moment, hell is no longer our future. It's heaven with Christ. It is avoidable. And I think that's the most important thing that we can know. While there's life, there's hope. And what that means is while we are living in this world, we have an opportunity to accept Christ and avoid hell. The moment we die, that opportunity has gone. That's why other churches talk about purgatory. It's because they, they feel that hell is such an awful place that surely after we die, we might get another chance. The answer is there is no purgatory. Once we die, we enter eternity. We face God, and God will either say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, come on in. Or he'll say to us, there is the burning hell where you eternally suffer physically, relationship-wise, emotionally and spiritually for eternity. And so, folks, you know your heart. You know whether you've ever given your life to Christ. If you haven't, and you're not quite sure how to do it, it's really simple, but if you would like me to pray with you, then you can guarantee with 100% that you're going to heaven and avoiding this terrible place called hell. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Your goodness says that you tell us the truth about reality. Very often, Lord, we, we turn to, to the newspapers or we turn to famous people or we turn to our friends for truth. And sometimes they say the things that we like because they know that we like them. But it's important that we turn to you for the truth. And the truth is that because of our sin and our life, and we all have sinned, one day we will go to hell. That's the reality. And that's why you came and you died on the cross, so that that might be avoidable. And as avoidable as we come to you and give to your lives, help us that each one of us here today may do that. And Lord, if there's anybody today who is not sure, Lord, speak to them and draw them into your kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship God as we present to God our morning offerings.
It says, the table of the Lord Jesus Christ is open for all of those who love the Lord Jesus. And if you've just committed your life to Christ, this table uh, is open to you. Uh, we'll remain seated as we sing, Great is the Lord. And we'll remain seated then if you have a token, if you're a communicant member of the church and you have a token, then your token uh, will be collected.
Let's hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they've been handed down to us by St. Paul. For I've received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and wine, give thanks. So we do that. Let's come before God and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you came to this earth. And as Paul reminds us on the night before you were betrayed, you took bread and wine similar to this and you gave thanks. You gave thanks for it, as was the custom. But we also give thanks because it reminds us, as you went on to explain, it reminds us of your body and your blood that was broken and spilt for us. You died on that cross so that we would not have to die spiritually. You died on that cross and taken upon yourself our sin. It means that hell will not be a reality for us. We thank you for that. But it means far more than that. Not only do we avoid hell, but we also have you living within us that we might have, as you, as you said to the disciples, life, abundant life, eternal, everlasting life to the fullness. And for those of us who trust in you, we know exactly what that means. That you're the God who is with us. You haven't taken us out of our problems. You haven't taken us out of this world of sin. But you are with us through our problems and through our difficulties. And so we thank you for this memorial of your death, reminding us that our sin is dealt with, reminding us that we are forgiven, reminding us that we are the children of Almighty God himself. Father, we thank you. Bless this bread and this wine, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. According to the Holy Institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of them, we do this. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he broke it, he said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This is new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember who I am and what I have done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it's such a privilege for us to meet around your table, to rededicate our lives to you, understanding again what it meant for you to die for us. Father, you have given us this day to rejoice in it, And help us to do that in all that we do today, that we may honour you in what we say and what we think and what we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.